Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer, and I'm back. There's an old saying, or a saying that's about as old as the internet, so the age of it may be a relative thing. And it goes, everything you put online is there forever. Or sometimes people will say, whatever you post online stays online. It's kind of like a reverse Las Vegas, I suppose. Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and whatever you put on the internet stays on the internet. But that's not really true, is it? So I'm going to roll out an unpopular opinion here and tell you that I'm a fan of Yanni. I have been since I was in high school, and as a pianist myself, I can play several of his songs on my own. As Casey Liss says on Accidental Tech Podcast, don't email me. Anyway, I told you that to tell you that a while back I happened across a YouTube video of some high school kids doing a full ensemble cover of one of his songs called Within Attraction. And they were covering the live version of this song, which features a pretty epic violin duet if you're into that kind of thing. Please, don't at me on Twitter either. I know my taste in music is suspect. I did a whole episode of this show on ambient and space music, so what do you expect? Anyway, these teens were good, man. And when they got to that violin part, they absolutely nailed it. I was impressed. I watched it a few times over the next several days, and eventually I moved on to other things. Then a few weeks ago, that video just kind of pops into my head again, so I go looking for it. And it's gone. Crap. Now, sure, maybe someone saved it, and maybe I could post something on Reddit or IRC or something to see if anyone bothered to save a copy of that video and if they might share it with me. But chances are, even if someone did save a copy of that video, I'm not going to find them. As Kusanagi once said, the net is vast and infinite, and the odds are I'm not going to bump into that person. Besides, it's my own fault. I should have saved that video myself at least one of those days where I was listening to it two or three times per day. But I didn't, and now it's gone. So the adage of nothing disappearing from the net is pretty flawed from where I stand. The net is like everything else, and there is a constant in the universe, and that constant is change. Things go up online, and then they drop off the net later. My old blog from the early 2000s? (laughs) Good luck on finding that. It's not even on the Wayback Machine. Since we started out this episode with an old saying, let me put a turn on another old saying, and then let me help you accomplish it. If you see something... Save something. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 52, Download Everything. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersection of libraries and technology and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hello, friends and listeners. No, your ears do not deceive you and your podcatcher isn't lying to you. Cyberpunk Librarian is back after a way too long hiatus and a bunch of bad craziness that, in you know, it's just so damn good getting back behind the microphone. So before we dive into the topic of the show, I wanted to do a little housekeeping and bring you up to speed with what's going on around Cyberpunk Librarian HQ. So if you've not caught the quick update that I put out a few weeks ago, I'll uh, I'll fill y'all in really quick. So I moved house and literally moved to another city. I used to live in Queen Creek, Arizona, and now I live in Mesa, which is a few miles to the northwest of Queen Creek. 
It's a lovely house, and it is much closer to the day job. No joke, commuting from Queen Creek to Phoenix easily ate up an hour or more each way, so I was spending over two hours per day in the car. Now, I'm there in about half that time. The commute's about 30 minutes or so. So yeah, that is excellent. Uh, but good lord, I hate moving. Oh, I hate everything about moving. But um, speaking of the day job, I got a promotion last fall. I'm a systems librarian now, and one of my primary goals after getting started was to upgrade the ILS. For the non-librarians in the crowd, the ILS is the integrated library system, and it's the software that powers the day-to-day -day business, uh, the day-to-day -day business operations of running the library. Everything we check out, we check in, put into the system, every card we make and every fine we take, I'll be watching. No, um, it'll all go through that ILS. It was a massive upgrade. It took months of preparation. And along with that, I spoke at a conference in Maryland. And if that wasn't bad enough, the day of the upgrade happened to be the same day as the move. Needless to say, things were stupid and insane for a while. Then... My website went down not once, but twice. And I'm not talking about a little outage here and there. I'm talking fully down. The second time was the most maddening because, as it turns out, my hosting provider didn't support anything above PHP 5.2, I think it was. Something like that. That's, you know, that wouldn't be a problem until the WordPress plugin that I use to publish the podcasts started requiring PHP 5.5 or above. There wasn't anything to do but upgrade my account or find someplace new. And while I, while I don't hate GoDaddy, I figured I'd look around for a place that specializes in WordPress hosting. I'll talk more about that later, but I did find a new place. I got things set up and then ran into a problem while exporting my content from the old hosting account because, you see, since the podcast plugin no longer worked, the shows didn't export. Oh, what fun. So I did manage to get an older version of the plugin running, so now I can see the shows, the show notes, and all of that happy stuff. So what I'm going to be doing is a slow and steady repopulation of the shows onto the feed here in the new location. You'll likely see some of these old shows turn up in your podcatcher, and that's all they are, just old shows. If you want to listen to them again, hey, be my guest. But I just wanted to explain what was going on in case there was some confusion. You're wondering why these shows, you know, why is episode 20-something showing up in my you know, in my podcatcher, I know he's up to episode 52 because he's talking about episode 52 right now. So, yeah, all of that aside, I think things are finally settling down a bit and thank all the cosmos for that. I've got shows I want to do. I've got notes and ideas and half-started scripts and projects and all kinds of stuff that I've wanted to get started on but couldn't because of all that craziness. So, for instance, I've got ideas for this show that uh, put a little more librarian into the cyberpunk librarian aspect of the show. I've got ideas for Generating X, and I've got an upcoming episode of Intergalactic Librarian that I've sat on because I needed the time to gather the sound effects, and I didn't have that time. But I think I have that time again, and I am so utterly glad and grateful. Welcome back to the show, my friends and listeners, and thank you Seriously, thank you for sticking with me. So, speaking of shows, maybe we should get on with this one. So today we're going to talk about saving everything. Now, I don't want to get into data hoarding here or anything on that level because that's a whole thing in and of itself. No, I'm talking about grabbing stuff off the web and various parts in the, of the net in an efficient way. Because if you happen to be a huge image junkie like me, you'll find that right-clicking everything isn't always the greatest way to get a bunch of stuff. 
But Homo sapiens are tool makers, and today I want to share the contents of my downloading toolbox with you. We're not only going to, we're not only going to talk about tools, but also techniques. To paraphrase Hunter Thompson, when you get locked into a serious downloading binge, the tendency is to push it as far as you can. So if you're just downloading everything to your downloads folder, you're eventually going to have to go in there and sort things out, move things around, clean it up. Oh, man. So with that in mind, we'll talk about ways to mitigate the mess and make cleanup fast and efficient. Indeed, to make cleanup not even need to happen. But first, let's talk about why we might want to save a bunch of things. I mean, after all... Just because you can save a thing from a website or something, that doesn't mean you should, does it? If we're honest, the reasons for downloading a whole bunch of stuff is as varied as the people on the internet itself. I can't, and I won't, speak for everyone, but I figure my reasons are pretty common among the whole of the online world, so I'll share those with you. I'd say I download and save far more than most people. I know people who will surf the web for days and they'll never save anything. They don't need to, or they don't want to, or whatever. They have their reasons. Anecdotally speaking, I'd say the biggest reason they don't bother saving something is because, well, it'll still be there when I need it. That news article with the beautiful picture will be there tomorrow, surely. That video of the cute kid winning the spelling bee, that'll be there next week. We can just bookmark it and come back later if we want to see it again. Well, my friends, we've, uh, we've already been over that, haven't we? Stuff falls off the net all the time. There's a decent chance that photo won't be there next week and that video will be gone sooner than you think because videos take up bandwidth, videos take up server space. Especially if we're talking about a news website or something because many of them will shove that into an archive behind a paywall and if you ever want to see that picture again, well, you're going to need to pony up some cash. Or you could have just saved it when you first saw it. Now, I'm sure there are a few folks out there who are going to play the intellectual property card and say something along the lines of, you know, saving a copy for yourself is like piracy, or it's making a legal copy, or whatever. And, you know, maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. But I do know one thing. If you put an image on a website, then you can right-click that image and save it. You can highlight the text and copy-paste it into a text document. There's barely any effort expended to do it. And that's because, well, that's how the web works. That's the entire point of the web from its very inception by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN. The web was there to share information. Web browsers have gone out of their way to make it so you can save a copy of almost everything you see on a website. Putting content on the web and then getting peeved about users saving it is kind of like building a parking lot and then getting upset because people are putting their cars there. Easily saving information from the web is built into the soul of the machine. Any content creator who doesn't understand this or tries to thwart it is not only doing their users a disservice, but they've forgotten how the web works. So, moving on, saving something so you have a copy of it is kind of just the beginning. What about saving something because it's going to disappear? Case in point, there used to be a fantastic podcast featuring some of the best space music on the planet. It was called Space Music. Okay. And it lived at spacemusic.nl. That's November Lima for those who can't understand NL. The folks behind it that uh, the folks behind that show decided that they wanted to do something new and different, which that's fair, of course you do. So they decided to end the show and move on to another kind of show. That's fine, that's fine. But they also said something along the lines of, "Hey, we're going to take down the episodes of the show and such, you know, on this date." So my friend Nightwise pointed this out to me, and I immediately went to work. Time was short, and this thing was going away. So much good music and a really good show would become difficult, if not impossible, to find. So I fired up a couple of tools here and there, got on a few things, got my computer going, and I downloaded the entire damn thing. 
I'm talking every single episode that I could get my greedy little paws on. You have to realize and accept that sometimes a thing is more important to some rando on the net than it is to the creator. And hey, that's okay. That's absolutely okay. The great thing is, sometimes an online rando can save the thing before it goes away. I've grabbed entire image sets, podcasts, music archives, and more, all because I enjoyed them and I didn't want to see them go away forever, which is something that can happen, especially with unique content that just does not exist anywhere else. And finally, for me, it's a bit of an it's a, uh, it's a bit of an obsession. I love JPEGs, folks. I love JPEGs and GIFs and WebMs and Pings and all manner of images that you can find online. I love cyberpunk art, surprise, surprise. But I also love images of beautiful scenery that invokes a sense of solitude and peace. I love images of ballet dancers. I love images of my favorite musicians and artists. I love images from comic books and video games and pulp science fiction and good lord, I do love me some images. So if I see a picture I like, I've got an entire system set up to grab a copy of that picture, file it away properly, back it up, and find it again later if I need to. This obsession goes all the way back to the days of dial-up bulletin board systems. Some local boards would carry directories full of images, and I'd blow my quota downloading them. But then I'd just upload images found on other systems and then download more images. I miss BBSs, that's for sure, but... I do like how it's much easier to find and save these images these days, and hey, no quota. No matter what your reasons, downloading a bunch of stuff is a useful tactic sometimes, no matter if it's research or archival or just simple personal enjoyment. Save everything. There is absolutely no guarantee that it will be there tomorrow or even 20 minutes from now, no matter what the old saying says. So okay, that in mind, let's get started. As I said before, we're going to discuss tools and techniques, and it's kind of hard to know where to start with either of them, since they're both deeply related to each other. To fall back on my woodworking metaphors, we can talk about how a scroll saw works to cut intricate designs into a piece of wood, but how you do that is another part of the same conversation. So I'm going to try and offer both sides of the coin as we go over both the tools and the techniques of mass downloading. I'm going to talk about some browser-based tools along with a couple of standalone options that are available to you. Now, I like using browser-based tools for one big reason. They tend to work everywhere. We are, after all, a cross-platform show, and you know what works everywhere? Firefox. Firefox works on Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. You also, you know what also works everywhere? Chrome. Or Chromium, if you like. You know what doesn't work everywhere? Windows-only apps, or Mac OS-only apps, or Linux-only apps. You know, these, these apps that may be good, but they're kind of siloed to, a, you know, to their operating system. So, you know, those don't work everywhere, and, you know, that can be a problem sometimes. And you know what doesn't work anywhere? Internet Explorer. Kidding aside, web browsers make an excellent cross-platform basis for your downloading needs. As I've often joked before, my preferred operating system of choice is Firefox. But I've got your back, my Chrome using listeners, because for each Firefox tool, I'll let you know about a similar tool for Chrome. Besides, with Firefox version 57 on the horizon, some of these tools might stop working if the developer doesn't adapt them to the new web extension style of add-on. So watch out for that later this year. Now, these tools aren't exactly the same, and that's because Chrome and Firefox aren't exactly the same. The extra little standalone tools, well, those are totally cross-platform. I know, because I use them everywhere myself. So right, let's start at ground zero first, which is your download directory. 
Your download folder should be a temporary directory, like a waiting room for files before they move on to the proper places on your system. Nothing, or at least very little, should live there on a permanent basis. It's just a convenient place for everything to go. If you do have a permanent thing in your downloads folder, it should be the structure of directories that powers your ability to sort files quickly. Properly organizing your downloads folder is kind of like cooking dinner. If you're keeping things tidy as you go, it's a lot easier to clean up later on. Chances are, your download directory won't look exactly like mine because you're probably not interested in exactly the same things. Like I said before, I'm an image junkie, and I have a folder in my download directory that is nothing more than images. It's called, predictably, Image Junkie. And it's not just a folder. It's a folder full of folders. Remember what I said about keeping things tidy? Well, here's your first step, and it'll become important later on. The folders in my Image Junkie directory classify the kinds of images saved to them. So there's the art folders, which are literally named things like art-anime, art-cyberpunk, art-fantasy, art-sci-fi, and so on. And then there are folders like retro for retro-style images, science, which is typically filled with astronomy-related pictures, but you get a few other things in there as well. Then there's tech and pop culture and a miscellaneous folder for stuff that just can't be classified. And that's not even all of them, folks. In all, there are 72 folders in Image Junkie alone. Some of them rarely get used, sure, but many of them are often catching new images. So why do I have this almost anal level of organization? Well, did you catch the part of the show title that mentions the librarian side of the podcast? Of course this stuff is organized. I'm a librarian. But also because I have a few scripts that utilize rsync to back up that folder full of folders full of images. Like I said, nothing should live permanently in your downloads directory, except maybe your structure. So every so often I run those scripts. Things get backed up to permanent locations, and if I need to, I will delete the entire image junkie folder and run one more script that rebuilds it in its entirety, but it's all empty. Along with the Image Junkie folder, there's the YouTube, books, video, and audio folders. I think you can figure out what those are for, but there's also one more that's for images that need sorting. Look, I said I was a junkie. That folder actually works with a Zapier connection that helps me save images that I like, heart, favorite, whatever they call it, on Tumblr. Those are part of the structure, and that's a fairly permanent resident in downloads as well. So sometimes I just need to pop in there and just move things around. Takes a few minutes. I sometimes will just create a folder for, you know, a given thing, and then move it or its contents later on. And then everything else can just land in downloads itself, and I'll sort from there. My point is, I've got a structure that helps me move things to permanent homes, and I'll delete anything else that isn't something I want to keep. Because, you know, you download programs that you need to install, and once you install them, you probably don't need to keep the installer. All of this helps me avoid a download directory filled with stuff where I have no idea what it is, where it's from, whether or not it's something I wanted to keep, or something I just needed for a few minutes. I mean, sometimes you download an animated GIF that you can throw up on Twitter and then you don't need it anymore. You know, so stuff like that. Right now, the uh, that directory at its top level consists of six folders and there's nothing in the root of the directory itself. Have you taken a look at your downloads directory recently? If it's a big mess, then build yourself a structure that helps keep that stuff organized. You can change the structure as you go. I've changed mine a lot of times, and I will probably alter it again at some point. Build what fits your needs and remodel it as necessary. Okay, so that's the basis and the foundation. Let's build upward, or to put it more succinctly, let's go download some files, baby.
Before we get started, let me remind you that you'll find links for all of these tools in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. So don't worry about writing down names or trying to remember what something is called. Just hit up the notes. That's what they're there for. Now then, you can do better than right-clicking everything you see, especially when there is so much to right-click. Say you're browsing around and you come across some obscure forum powered by PHPBB, and you're pretty sure it's being run on a server that lives in someone's garage or basement. Or maybe it's a server in a basement garage. Have you ever considered that? Either way, you uh, you discover that this thing has page after page of beautiful cyberpunk images, and you want most of them, if not all of them. I might be speaking from experience here. You know what would be horrible? Right-clicking each one, selecting Save Image As, selecting a directory and maybe a folder in that directory, hitting Enter, and then doing that over and over and over again. No, my friends, we we are better than this. So let's talk about better ways to save images, and truthfully, lots of other singular files. Starting with Firefox, let me turn you on to an add-on called Save File 2. This is an add-on I've had installed on Firefox for years, and it's one of the greatest greatest add-ons ever. Save File 2 adds options to your right-click menu that are tailored to saving links, images, and files. Within its preferences, you can select which folders you would like these files and images to go to, and you can specify that Save File 2 also display the list of subfolders in a given folder. Now you see why I have 70-some-odd folders in my image junkie directory. So, you can even set Save File 2 to display a list of the last folders that you saved to. So, with this, uh, with the system, you just, you know, this thing just pops up another menu with your folder options, and then you can save that image into the exact folder. No more of this downloading to a folder and then sorting later on because you're sorting these images as you save them. And as I said, it's not just images. It can be files, it can be links, whatever. And you can set up options for each one. So you might not be saving images in the same place as you save regular files. So you can set up the options as needed. So for example, that directory of cyberpunk images... I'll just bring up the full-size image, right-click, get the menu, and go to Save File 2. That pops up my recent folders, and you can bet that the art-cyberpunk folder is on that list, and probably near the top, it gets a lot of use. So I select that, and that image is downloaded straight to the proper folder. No, No fuss, no muss. And that will work for general files and links. It's freaking brilliant, and it saved me so much time because I don't have to sort anything. So on the Chrome side of things, you have image-toolbar. Now, I know that is that sounds weird, but yes, that is image, a hyphen, and toolbar. Look for it in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. It's very much like Save File 2, but it's specifically targeted to saving images. Once again, you can set up your structure in your download directory and then use Image Toolbar to save directly to the proper folder. It has a couple of limitations in that it must save to the downloads directory or a folder in downloads. Now, that's a Chrome thing, so nothing to be done there. Also, your path can't be too long. So, I've gotten around this last limitation through the magic of Simlinks on macOS and Linux. Not as easy on Windows, but you can probably make it work there too. While it's not quite so full-featured as Save File 2, it is a brilliant Chrome extension, and it has been a sorely needed bit of software in that space. I mean, I literally did a little chair dance when I found this, because I don't want to be too reliant on one particular system. Like I said, Firefox 57 might kill Save File 2. We don't know yet. But you know what's better than downloading one file at a time? Downloading all of the files at once. And that's where Down Them All comes in on Firefox. As the name of the add-on implies, Down Them All gives you easy access to grabbing a lot of stuff at once. That form with the cyberpunk art? Well, I can set down them all to download the linked images. 
In other words, I can have it grab the images themselves and not the thumbnails. I don't want the thumbnails, I want the big images. And I can specify which folder to download them to, so they're just going to go straight to that art-cyberpunk folder. Even better, I can go through this form page by page, adding images to the down the mall queue and fire off the batch when I get everything set up. You can set options that allow for the maximum simultaneous downloads, maximum connections per server, and more. And even better, once you set up your initial download options, you can just keep adding things to it by selecting the DTA one-click from the context menu in Firefox. It even plays a happy little tune when you're done downloading. Now over in Google Chrome land, you'll find a, a couple of helpful tools. One of which is Bulk Image Downloader. Like Save File 2 versus Image Dash Toolbar, Bulk Image Downloader doesn't have the full featured nature of Down the Mall, but it'll get the job done. This extension basically scrapes the page you're looking at and offers you an interface for selecting what you want. It's got some intelligent filtering that allows you to limit by file type and in the case of images, set a maximum width and or height. So if you're looking at, you know, a page that's got large images and small images, once again, you only want the large ones, you can kind of set a minimum to uh, have it download only those. And that's really good on image boards where BID pulls in the thumbnails in, into the mix. And, you know, like I said, you want the linked images, not those thumbnails. So then there's Multi-File Downloader, or MFD. MFD is a Chrome extension designed for utility. It ain't pretty, folks. It doesn't have the friendliest UI, but it will totally download everything on a given web page. You can filter by name and extension, and you can specify a directory to download to, and then you can turn it loose. Like Bulk Image Downloader, MFD scrapes the page for links, gives you a list, and then rolls everything through the Chrome download method to get you the things you asked for. Between the two of these extensions, you'll get parity with Down Them All for Firefox. Now, as I've said before, and I may be harping on this a bit, some of these Firefox extensions are in danger of disappearing with the upgrade to web extensions set for Firefox 57, which is why I'm letting you know about the alternatives for Chrome. The developer behind the project for, uh, say, Down Them All is extremely pissed about the change, and I, uh, I will link to his blog post in the show notes. That post is mostly just an email that he wrote to Mozilla as a whole, and to the Mozilla mailing lists, and it's worth a look if you can handle some strong language. It's likely that there will be a fork of Firefox that just keeps the normal add-on ecosystem going in some form. So watch that space, but just keep in mind, it'll likely be a bit turbulent until things settle down. So okay, now to finish up with a couple of utilities that aren't browser-based, but are totally cross-platform. And these little beauties will help you gather videos and entire websites, too, if you need that kind of thing. So, have you ever had a situation where you're absolutely sure that everybody has heard about this thing that you know, but you're shocked when you find someone who doesn't? Now, like lots of cyberpunks, nerds, geeks, and librarians alike, I figured most everybody has heard of YouTube-DL by now. Uh, but I keep running into people who haven't. I mean, they cock their head to one side like a dog hearing a strange noise that it can't identify. So let me give you the DL on YouTube DL. I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that one. YouTube DL is a command line program for Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's written in Python and will require Python to be available on your system, except for Windows where it'll run as an exe file. On the Mac side of things, I've installed it using Homebrew on macOS, and you can get it a couple of different ways on Linux, either through repos, curls, or pip. Links in the show notes, of course. YouTube DL bills itself as a video downloader for YouTube and, quote, a few more sites, end quote. Now, they do have a list of the supported sites on the YouTube DL website, and by a few more, they mean a few hundred more. 
I really don't know how many sites it supports, but audience, you're going to be scrolling down that list for a while if you're using one of those ratchety sounding clicky mouse wheels. Let's just say I've only run into one or two sites that YouTube DL didn't work with, and I don't even remember what they, you know, what they were. Basically, if you're looking at a web page with a video on it, YouTube DL can put that video on your SSD or HD or whatever your storage preferences are. Now, I won't dive into all of the options that YouTube DL has to offer because that'd literally be a show in and of itself, but I will give you some idea on the power of this program. After installation, you can just pop into a terminal window and type YouTube DL, a space, and then paste the URL of the website with the video on it. And it'll go to work. It just goes to work pulling down and transcoding that video. That's all well and good, but it does so much more. It can also pull down entire YouTube channels, just feed it the URL of the channel. It can pull down YouTube playlists, the entire thing, just feed it the, uh, the URL of the playlist. Do some, uh, it can do some post-processing tasks and more. Since it's a terminal program, you can script it and, you know, you can script the hell out of it and bash or do all kinds of cool stuff. As I watch YouTube videos, I'll sometimes just keep a list of, uh, you know, a list of those videos that I want to save. Then I can feed that list to YouTube DL and have it gather the videos in a directory for me. All you need is a text file full of links. That's, that's it. YouTube DL can handle that. And keep in mind, that list can contain links to videos that aren't on YouTube. It works with tons of other sites. So I'll have a link in the show, no uh, the show notes to a great post on Reddit from a user who shared their YouTube DL script for incrementally backing up YouTube channels. So you would basically download you know, an, an entire channel and then run the script every so often and it will go check the channel for new videos and then just download the new videos while not bothering with the stuff that you already have. Oh, and remember how I said a deep dive into this program would be a show in and of itself? Well, I got your back, dear ones. Hit up the link in the notes and dig on the Nightwise podcast, episode KW807, where he lays things out in depth. YouTube DL is free and open source, and it's absolutely amazing. If you've not gotten in on this, you need to check it out, because let's face it, I've seen entire YouTube channels disappear overnight, and I've seen great videos fall off the net. If you see something you like, it's just not a bad idea to save it. And finally, sometimes you may find it useful to grab parts of, or all, of a website. You might happen across an open directory of ebooks or music and, you know, whatever. And you might wonder, isn't there a better way than right-clicking everything? After all, you may want the contents of a directory and maybe some directories a level down or something. Well, that's where wget comes in. Like YouTube DL, wget is a command line utility where you just feed a URL at, you know, at its basis and it will just start gobbling up everything it can based upon that URL. And I'm talking mirroring the entire website. You can also tell it to go down a given number of directories and no further. And that's useful if you're pulling down, in, say, an image to, you know, an images directory. And within that images directory, there's also a thumbnails directory. And you can have wget crawl downward into the thumbnails directory and get that too. It has the ability to resume aborted downloads and it's designed to handle slower networks. Now keep in mind, you might have some drek hot fiber running into your office, and I'm jealous if you do, uh, especially if you have it running into your home. Seriously, the G Google Fiber has not come to Mesa, and oh boy. Anyway, so you might have you know a very high-speed stable connection, but the website you're accessing might not. Remember that cyberpunk images website that was probably run on someone's server in their garage basement. Yeah. So even if your transfer is slow and laggy and you're not getting those complete files, wget will keep trying until you get the whole file. It just slogs along and chugs along, downloading and downloading until it gets everything that you asked for. 
It's literally intended to be an execute and forget kind of program. I have a small box here that doesn't do much of anything, and I don't really use it for anything. And that very fact makes it the perfect platform for WGIT and YouTube DL because I can fire off a command and let it work. I can just do it and turn my back and go do something else. I don't have to babysit it. I don't have to check on it very often. Especially with WGIT, maybe I can just check on it every couple of hours to make sure it's still going. And when I'm saying I'm checking to make sure it's still going, what I really mean is that I'm checking to make sure the computer hasn't had a network hiccup or anything. It's got a flaky nick in it. I'm uh, I'm more worried about the network connection than I am WGIT. Oh, and yes, of course, WGIT is totally cross-platform and is GPL software. So what are you waiting for? If you see it, save it. And if you want to make sure it's still there tomorrow, download it. Because in this age of digital uncertainty, strange governments doing strange things, three-letter agencies trying to mess up the net from what it is, downloading is archiving. Data should be free, but it should also be yours. And that wraps up this episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. I thank you for tuning in and thank you for sticking with the show. I mean, good Lord, if you still have this in your podcatcher after all of this time away and this thing came up and you thought, oh, well, I'll give it another shot. Thank you for giving it another shot. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you picked up some ideas on how to make downloading a lot easier. And there's ever so much more out there to uh to help you on with that but this will get you started in the realms of saving anything and everything that you want so check the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast you're going to find links to all of the tools and a few other goodies there as well The tune you're currently digging on is Nocturnia by Psychedelic Pedestrian. Earlier in the show, you heard Unprovoked Attack, Druid's March, and Pacific, also by Psychedelic Pedestrian. Uh, To kind of ease the transition back into actually doing shows again, I kind of just went with one of my favorite artists, and boy, oh boy, I do love myself some Psychedelic Pedestrian. So check the show notes, and you will find links to all of these tracks, along with the opening track, which, as always, is Belly Dance at Abisu by Rio Miashta. Cyberpunk Librarian would like to thank the Internet Archive at archive.org for all that they do, hosting, saving, and, you know, actually downloading some of the Internet themselves. And by some of it, I mean large quantities of the Internet, and then sharing it right back to you. The Internet Archive at archive.org has videos, video games, audio, music, podcasts like this one, podcasts that are nothing like this one. So, hey, check them out. Maybe throw a little money their way. I do when I can, and I love them for all that they do. The Internet Archive at archive.org. Thank you so very much. If you'd like to get in touch with me, well, I highly recommend that you do so, and I love hearing from the listeners. So, (sighs) MZ closed down. I really liked MZ. But I guess no one else liked MZ, so the MZ site, you know, mz.com slash cyberpunklibrarian is gone forever. Remember what I said about things falling off the internet? MZ fell off the internet. You know what hasn't fallen off the internet? Facebook. And you can communicate with me there at facebook.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. You can find me on Twitter where I am at Bibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. And if you would like to deliver your thoughts via the tried and true SMTP way, you can hit me at cyberpunklibrarian at protonmail.com. I would love to hear from you and hey i am back i am getting these shows up and running again and it feels so good to be sitting on this side of the microphone so thanks again for tuning in thanks for sticking with me i'm gonna get out of here i will see you in the next episode and hey remember you don't have to be high tech to be low budget but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk i'll catch you next time